These days, store-bought Halloween props are actually super cool and super creative. But no matter how awesome the prop, they all seem to have one glaring flaw. The motion sensor on them is garbage. During the day, they're awesome. Wave your hand in front of it and boom, it goes off and scares you. But at night, when you most need it, you can do the exact same thing and nothing happens. They all seem to use the same type of cheap sensor, which is intended to measure brightness levels and not really motion. But of course, during the day, it works pretty well because when you step in front of the prop, then the light intensity on the sensor happens to change because you cast a shadow and therefore the prop goes off. But my wife and I really need these props to work at night. I'm going to show you how I modify this clown to use a much better motion sensor called a PIR and I'll show you how you can do the same thing yourself. This modification should work on most Halloween props as long as the prop comes with a test button that lets you activate it manually. However, you're modifying your prop at your own risk. There is a chance you could damage it or that the instructions won't work on your particular prop. Before we start adding any electronics, we need a way to power them. This is a battery operated prop. So rather than adding my own separate power source, I'm going to solder in some extra wires to make use of the existing power available. Crimping some spade connectors works really well here. They can be jammed between the plastic and the terminals of a battery pack and then reinforced with generous amounts of solder. Just don't get things too hot or you'll damage the compartment. The other end of a wire can be attached to any connector of your choice. I like these cheap JST connectors for anything lower power. The connector will have to be able to exit the battery compartment so there's a good chance you'll have to cut a hole in it to make that happen. Now that I know that I can power this thing, it's time to build the circuit board. There are three basic sections to this circuit. The first is power input and voltage regulation. The motion module can accept between 2.7 and 3.6 volts, so for almost all props, this requires a voltage regulator to regulate the power coming from the prop. The second part to this circuit is the motion module itself, and all the connections and parts needed to tune it and make it work correctly. I've chosen the Zilog Z-Motion module as my PIR sensor. It's got a pretty long sensing range, 21 feet or 7 meters, which is actually great for outdoor props. Lastly is the output that takes the signal from the motion sensor and triggers the prop via the same connector that the test button uses. Let's start the assembly with the power section, which is also the simplest. Okay, I dare say that went pretty well, and that's the power section of the project. If I had to solder this again, I would have routed this one wire a little bit differently so it's not going over the regulator, but eh, it's fine. And so what you can see here is we have this connector here, and that's where the power from the clown prop comes in into the board. So this is unregulated. It's going to be going straight from the battery pack and that means it's going to be anywhere from like three and a half volts all the way to four and a half volts. So that's why we have this regulator here. It's just a linear regulator. This is the LD1117V33. If you wanted to, you can use a switching regulator and that will be more efficient, but it comes at the cost of way more parts. So it's a trade-off. When you're connecting one of these regulators, you'll see in the data sheet that they require capacitors, one on the input, and that's a 100 nanofarad capacitor. So that's that little ceramic capacitor right here. And then I also needed a 10 microfarad capacitor and I couldn't find a ceramic one on hand. So instead I used an electrolytic. If you're gonna use an electrolytic, that's fine. Just watch your polarity so you don't hook it up the wrong way. Now it's time to get the motion sensor hooked up. I'm gonna begin this part by placing the motion module itself because this is the one and only piece on this project where placement is absolutely critical because this little dome here has to be sticking out of the bottom of a clown 
and therefore I do need it right at the edge of the project. If we look at the schematic or the data sheet for the motion module, there are at least three pins that we want to connect to 3.3 volts. The first pin is pin number two because that's what actually supplies power to the module. Then we have pin number six. Pin number six allows you to attach a photoresistor to the module and have the module auto disable itself when the photoresistor detects that it's daylight outside. And then we have pin number seven, which is only really useful if you're gonna use this module with a microcontroller and it allows you to put the module to sleep and to preserve battery power. The module is connected to ground through pin one or pin eight. You don't have to connect them both. I'm gonna go ahead and make these connections now. Next we have pins three and four. They are both going to receive a potentiometer and resistor in series with each other. Pin three is the delay pin. It tells the motion module how long to register motion once it detects it. This value can range from two seconds by setting this pin to zero volts or all the way to 15 minutes by setting this pin to 1.8 volts. Pin four, the sense or sensitivity pin also ranges from zero volts to 1.8 volts and controls how sensitive the module is to motion. The lower this value, the more sensitive the module is and the higher this value, the less sensitive it is. I'm gonna go ahead and solder on some of these bad boys and their accompanying resistors. So that's the motion module soldered on, except for the most critical pin, which is pin five, the motion detect pin. I'm gonna save that one for last though and focus first on getting the output connections ready to go. Okay, we're fast forwarding a little bit in time. I've just had my dinner. Wash your hands after soldering, by the way, folks. Uh, lead ingestion does kill the human. So I've got the precious octocoupler here. I've got another uh, wire connector, JST style. I've got a PNP transistor, and then I've got a couple of resistors. So why don't I pop these on the uh, circuit board, and then we'll talk about how this last part of the circuit works. That is everything soldered up. So let's talk about the last part of the circuit. So when the motion module detects that there is motion, it puts out a low signal on pin five. So in order to be able to do something with that signal, we need to be able to react to it being low. And that's where a PNP transistor comes in nicely because it starts conducting when the base is set to low. The transistor is connected to 3.3 volts and over to the octocoupler through a 100 ohm resistor. We need that resistor because an octocoupler literally has an LED inside of it that then when lit up activates a photosensitive transistor. So hence the 100 ohm resistor, just like any other LED, we need to limit the current going to it. What the octocoupler allows us to achieve is to reliably switch that test button, generally regardless of how it's actually implemented in the Halloween prop. We don't have to make a whole bunch of assumptions, such as the voltage of that test button, or that one of the two leads actually does go to ground and not to some other voltage. After getting the circuit built, I started to test it and discovered some really weird behavior. Sometimes the clown would trigger at the slightest motion, but then other times I could wave and wave my hand in front of it and nothing would happen. Until suddenly it did for a few seconds and then the clown would get cut off in the middle of its animation. This was driving me crazy and we need to talk about it because you might run into the same problem. Remember how I connected my circuit to the clown's battery pack? Well, I finally had an epiphany and realized that this clown prop has a lot of movement and that means there are some kind of motors in there that are probably drawing a decent amount of current as soon as they start moving. When this happens, there is a voltage drop because the batteries can only output so much current. Here's my oscilloscope hooked up across the three batteries in the clown. While it's off, I can measure a very steady 4.2 volts across the batteries. Now I turn on the clown. And boom! Here's a capture of the voltage immediately dropping. 
that linear voltage regulator that I chose can't keep up with this. The voltage drops below the 3.3 volts it's supposed to be putting out and eventually cuts off completely. This reboots the Z-Motion module and forces it to recalibrate, which means it's not working for about 20 seconds. And in the process, this triggers the test button again, causing the prop to stop in the middle of its animation. I'm kind of surprised at myself for not catching this earlier, because I had to resolve a very similar issue with my custom dog collar light. It's time to learn. <laughs> I bypassed the linear regulator that I had soldered into my circuit and instead used this LM2596 regulator instead. This regulator can respond to voltage drops much better and it can also regulate voltage down or up, so if a battery voltage drops too low, this doesn't cut out the module completely. I also tried adding a beefy 1000 microfarad capacitor to smooth out the voltage drop even more, but in further testing that wasn't strictly necessary. I also added an LED so that I can actually see when the motion module detects motion. This was very helpful for troubleshooting. The schematic in the description of this video includes this LED as well as the improved voltage regulator choice. At this point we should have a working circuit that's capable of controlling a prop. Now it's time for some fine tuning. The design has two potentiometers. In my case this one controls the delay of the module and this one controls the sensitivity. Let's begin with delay. Once the module detects motion, delay indicates how long it should stay in that detected state. In our case, the ideal delay is roughly how long it takes for the prop to animate, and then maybe a little bit of extra time on top of that to keep it from re-triggering right away. The second setting is the sensitivity. I was hoping that this would allow you to control the range of the sensor, especially because the data sheet does claim that you can change the range on this chip, but that's not quite how it works. Instead, sensitivity seems to control how much motion you need in order for the sensor to activate. A lower sensitivity seems to make it a little bit harder to trigger the sensor, and higher sensitivity puts it on more of a hair trigger. With the circuit board built, it's now time to hide the whole mechanism within the prop in a way that kids won't really notice it. In my case, I designed and 3D printed this extension piece for the cage of the clown. The idea is to mount the bottom of this extension piece to the clown's cage like so. The circuit board lives inside of this extension piece with the motion sensor sticking out. I'm gonna go ahead and get it mounted properly. And that's how you make a Halloween prop such as this one actually work in the dark. This clown is now ready for the haunted circus. I hope that this video has motivated you to make modifications to your own Halloween props. And if you plan to do so, be sure to check out the description down below. I've posted the schematic, I've posted some helpful tips, and of course comment and let us know what you end up building. And while you're at it, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe, it really helps the channel out. Now I'm off to put these sensors into a few more props.